We all find different things frightening, and every horror game has its audience, whether it be ghosts, demons, aliens, other humans, or threats from beyond the veil. And games have used a wide variety of ways to scare players for decades. I often find though that the scares section is the hardest to write for all of the reviews, mostly because it's a complex topic. If you saw the Atmosphere video, then welcome back. If not, then I recommend seeing that first. Atmosphere is what helps make the things I'm going to talk about in this video work. So let's get started. Every game sets out to do different things. Psychological horror games usually focus on creating a deep feeling horror that almost blends with the atmosphere, and other games rely on jump scares or chase sequences to inflict panic or terror. There's a reason why it's difficult to put one game ahead of another in terms of scares, because not all games need them and not all games use the same things. Most of the time when I find people were disappointed by an experience, it wasn't necessarily because it was bad, but because they expected one thing and got something else. It's important to realise that not all games are meant to be scarefests. A lot of games will resort to cheap scares, which is normally just startling the player. A cheap scare can happen whenever players aren't ready for it and takes next to no effort to execute at all. Jess! Buddy, you in there? Ah! Whoa! Characters scaring other characters and until dawn, enemies getting up and suddenly fighting you in dead space. It just needs to catch the player off guard. Jump scares can really be anything, but mostly fall into the tropes of loud noises and something appearing in front of the player. Anybody can be shocked by anything at any time, but loud noises are a broad spectrum that work on almost anyone. Just look at the jump scares in Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. It's almost humiliating that you got frightened by a cute cardboard skeleton. But when they use sparingly, they can be terrifying. The use of tension and building dread in Five Nights at Freddy's culminates in a single jump scare that you spend your entire time playing trying to avoid. It's arguable that everything that builds up to the jump scare is scarier than the jump scare, though. Whilst it's very common and easy for jump scares to amount to nothing more than a loud noise, there's sometimes an art to making them work. Layers of fear lures you into a scripted event with a rat running into a fire, which is a pretty bizarre thing to see, and it's usually worth looking at. But as you turn around, a humanoid-shaped pile of books suddenly lunges at you, which is a shock. It really feels as though the game is messing with you, and the best part about this specific event is if the player chooses to ignore the rat and move on, then nothing happens at all, which saves the game face. This is important because nothing detracts more from a horror game's ability to scare the player than things not working, or things working when they aren't meant to. The more seams the player sees in the game's design, the less likely they are to be afraid of it. Suspension of disbelief is really important in horror games. In Emily Wants to Play, jump scares are the price you pay for failing one of the doll's challenges, which can happen pretty often. I personally find it very easy to become desensitised to relentless jump scares when it's the same one used over and over. Using the same tactics to scare the player will almost certainly either tire them out or desensitise them to the experience, in the same way that constant stealth in Alien Isolation becomes somewhat tiring by the end. And when the player isn't afraid of the consequences of failing, then the rest of the experience doesn't matter, because they've gone past the point where the game can scare them. Fear in horror games is generated by a multitude of things. From the aforementioned moments in Five Nights at Freddy's where you lose track of one of the robots and start to panic trying to find them, to a grunt appearing in Amnesia the Dark Descent and you have to suddenly run or hide. The moments when you think you're in danger. Most of these moments only work when the player is immersed and relies heavily on the atmosphere to make events like these as frightening as they are. Fear can also just be irrational, and things like enemy design can go a long way to inflict fear when there isn't even any danger. The very first time I encountered a golem in Haunting Ground, there was a lot of apprehension that the large, earth-coloured entity may hurt me, when in reality they never attack Fiona and only move when you insert plates into them. Things like this are only possible thanks to the design and atmosphere. Horror games are usually more than the sum of their parts. 
For a long time now, the feeling of vulnerability and helplessness has been a key factor to increasing fear in horror games. Being able to kill the enemies presented in front of you is empowering to a degree, and taking that away from the player can be both intimidating and potentially frustrating. But no one way is better than the other. Whilst not being able to fight the enemies in Outlast makes them more frightening to run away from or sneak around, making the combat more frantic and visceral like in Lost in Vivo can also stress the player out for each new encounter, whilst making them feel weak even though they're armed. For me, the spiders in System Shock 2 are the most horrifying creatures in any game I've ever played and cause me immediate revulsion. The design, the noises they make, the fact they're hard to hit with melee weapons and difficult to shoot because of their speed and resistance to energy weapons, and the toxic damage they inflict, all come together to create what is for me the most terrifying enemy in any game I've played thus far. But this is specific to me, and many people might not find the spiders to be frightening at all. Fear can really be triggered by anything, and that's what makes horror games so fascinating. That moment where your stomach drops, when you know what's happening. Silent Hill 3 has the moment where you enter the mirror room and find that you can't leave. There's the building fear that you're going to die as you frantically try to open the door after searching the room for another way out. Black veins race across the floor and you've got no idea what's happening or how to stop it. Your reflection turns black as you lose all hope because from this brief moment, you're at the mercy of the game. Creating an enemy in a horror game is easy to do, but also easy to get wrong. A truly intimidating enemy should be both powerful but creepy. Nemesis from Resident Evil 3 was a terrifying and seemingly unstoppable monster that was both extremely powerful thanks to his ability to throw Jill around, but also because he kept returning to confront Jill every time she thought she got away. Entering combat with him was extremely dangerous, and thanks to the tank controls, Jill felt like she was always at a major disadvantage. The same goes for the alien in Alien Isolation. It's faster, stronger, and has more acute senses than you, to the point that shooting it does nothing but annoy it, and it can tell when you're hiding in a locker. But there's a point where the enemies are portrayed as too powerful, and dying often to the same antagonist can build resentment towards it, and eventually just numb the player to death. So it's really a fine line. In Lethe, the murderous woman that chases the player near the end of the game can be stunned by throwing things at her, and she stops chasing after a small walk away from her, which just stops her being terrifying and makes her come across as just an inconvenience. Same goes for the monster that follows the player in Mists of Aiden. It's moving way too slowly for it to ever catch up with you, and its general appearance comes across as bizarre rather than frightening. Ideally, normal enemies need to be like the zombies in Resident Evil, not initially threatening, but still difficult to deal with. Alone in the Dark, the new nightmare makes enemies feel like an annoyance rather than a threat, with the game having an abundance of both weapons and ammunition as well as health kits when you get hurt. This makes combat very easy, whereas Resident Evil, if you haven't been careful with your ammo, you'll be fighting enemies with a knife, which will go very badly unless you're very good at the game. What makes this so frightening is the difference between the save systems both games use. Resident Evil, of course, has the ink ribbons and typewriters, which is a finite amount of saves in a specific location, meaning that if you save too often, you'll run out, and if you die, you'll go back to the last typewriter you used, which adds a lot of stress to the gameplay. Whereas Alone in the Dark allows the player to save whenever and wherever they want, and at least in the PC version, provided an overwhelming number of save charms to use. Often the fear of dying comes from losing progress, and when that's not a problem, then dying isn't that much of a big deal. Forcing enemy interactions through cutscenes is also very hit and miss. In games like Bloodwash, the Wound Ripper appears to be deadly, but you don't really interact with it until the end of the game. Depending on whether the player notices this or not, it'll either make the Wound Ripper appear as terrifying as the developers intended, or it'll remove all of the fear entirely, since they don't personally feel threatened. Psychological horror is often perceived as games messing with their players with either mind-bending scenery or confusing and dread-filled environments and plotlines. It's mostly done with atmosphere and graphic design rather than any kind of entity. 
Silent Hill is both one of the first and the best examples of psychological horror. The town of Silent Hill itself almost feels like a character in its bizarre, changing environments and seemingly horrifying and nonsensical transitions from an eerie, contemporary setting to something more akin to a nightmare. Its scares often have dramatic builds up that lead to absolutely nothing, and sudden loud noises occur with no identifiable source. A common trope of psychological horror is the game trying to replicate the effect of losing one's sanity. It's often done badly, usually portrayed as a swirling screen in games like Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth or Blair Witch. It's not to say that some games don't do it well though. The idea that the game is messing with you can be done in many ways, and it's often done to make the player lose grip of the reality placed within the game. It's very easy to desensitise a player to weird events by allowing them to completely lose track of what's meant to be going on. In Layers of Fear 2, the player is shuffled through strange and incomprehensible environments with a story that's poorly conveyed to the player, and it's very easy just to give up trying to figure out what's happening and just press on despite it. Psychological horror is often best conveyed through the story, and bringing up Silent Hill yet again, Silent Hill 2 is one of the most textbox examples of psychological horror done right. The game messes with the player by presenting James who's received a letter from his dead wife. This immediately unsettles the player because they know that's impossible, making James come across as unhinged or confused. As the game goes on, the frightening and immensely sad consequences of his actions become clear, and it's revealed that there was no letter, and when checked in the game's inventory, the letter he received is blank. The characters in the game, especially Maria, taunt and gaslight him, whilst other characters like Angela come across as broken in her own deeply saddening way. It's haunting to realise, and it was often enough just to make me feel like I was doing something wrong by playing the game. Whilst no form of horror is better or worse than another, I find that psychological horror lingers long after the game is turned off. And that's the end of the video. This was a pretty complex video and there was a lot of stuff I probably missed because there's just so many ways games can be scary and I don't think I could ever hope to cover them all in one video. Next time we'll be talking about sound design and how important it is in horror games. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you want to support the channel on Patreon and get access to some sporadically released reviews including Sweet 776 and soon I'll be reviewing Rule of Rose for Patreon supporters too as a thank you then you can head on over to Patreon. Again, I'd like to remind you this whole thing is down to my opinion in horror games, and if you don't share this opinion, then that's cool, I get it. I'd like to point out that whilst I think scares are important, I did not scream like a banshee or run away from the computer and advise you don't either. There'll be more horror reviews in the pipeline, and thanks for watching. And always go check out Bumps in the middle of the night. Peace.